Um, we are here uh, today with our second appointment. Um, the first one was uh, last September um, with the President Prize. And today we will have the presenter who was uh, awarded uh, the Victor Fernandez Blanco Prize uh, for uh, the uh, Best Paper Award at the Younger Researcher Workshops uh, at the past uh, uh, assay conference uh, uh, held in Bloomington uh, last summer. And uh, this is the second appointment. And uh, as a reminder, we will have the third and last appointment about uh, with the third prize uh, awarded uh, during the assay conference, uh, namely the Pomerene Prize. Uh, this is uh, on the 12th of September. But let's now introduce uh, the uh, presenter of today. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I introduce myself. I'm Elisabetta Lazzaro, the CS coordinator, professor of uh, creative industries management at the University for the Creative Arts in the UK. And uh, I'm so pleased to introduce uh, Dylan Thompson, uh, the, the prize recipient. Uh, he uh, is a currently uh, he's a PhD ca a candidate at the Department of uh, Economics at Macquarie University. And uh, his uh, research interests uh, uh, focus on uh, uh, the contemporary live music industries. And this is what he's going to, to speak today. And actually, he's going to present, to present uh, a PhD paper. So PhD students, uh, young scholars, uh, you can also make it. You can also get uh, the Young Researcher Workshop Hour, so stay tuned. So the floor is yours, uh, Dylan, you can start. Cool, thank you very much, Elisabetta. Um, yeah, so for those who haven't met me before, um, for those who didn't uh, get to meet in Bloomington, my name's Dylan, um, and I'm a PhD candidate uh, at the Department of Economics at Macquarie University. So I'll be presenting my second chapter from my uh, PhD, um, which is a, a discrete choice experiment uh, aim to uh, analyze uh, concert ticket preferences of, um, uh, you know, hopefully a representative sample of uh, concert consumers. Um, and I've sort of changed the title um, from what you might have seen up on the um, COS uh, website to um, sort of play at the sort of trade off idea that I'm getting out with this uh, research um, with uh, the way uh, both. Uh, producers, musicians, and consumers must make trade-offs with uh, their decisions um, uh, in the music industry or in the, in the live music industry. Um, so my motivation for this study um, has basically been um, to do with the fact that concert ticketing has become increasingly important um, over the last uh, 20 years as the uh, concert sector has become the dominant source of revenue for uh, contemporary musicians. Uh, and at the same time, concert ticketing practices have become uh, increasingly more sophisticated. So over that period, musicians started to um, you know, play around with using uh, or uh, employing various types of you know, standard price discrimination practices by setting different prices for uh, tickets to different parts of uh, uh, different parts of the venue uh, or setting different prices across different venues when they were on tour. And uh, more recently, they've started experimenting by uh, offering what we call VIP packages, so uh, a bundle of services um, that people can purchase uh, to you know, enhance their concert experience, uh, whether that be meeting the artist or having access to a priority bar or uh, better seating. Um, and uh, you know, musicians have, uh, particularly superstar musicians, have, have been, uh, have been uh, uh, increasingly recently. Um, now, the theory behind price discrimination uh, being developed mainly in the concert or the ticketing concept by, uh, context by uh, Rosen and Rosenfeld suggests that successful price discrimination in terms of increasing uh, concert revenue uh, depends on consumer preferences, um, but in particular uh, preference heterogeneity. Um, so, you know, the more heterogeneity there is in consumer preferences for concert tickets, uh, the um, you know, more revenue uh, or more successful price discrimination uh, can be, but there's limited empirical evidence on consumer preferences for concert tickets uh, and um, 
to get attributes such as VIP packages to, for musicians to uh, be able to know uh, how much price discrimination they can employ. Um, and alongside this, uh, the finding from my first PhD chapter um, suggests that when musicians uh, use a certain type of uh, price discrimination, use second degree price discrimination by setting different prices for different seating areas within a venue, um, they typically trade off uh, their ability to sell out uh, the um, the, you know, the event, the concert, for higher ticket revenue. So uh, it would be important to know how much more revenue um, artists can uh, generate from price discrimination, um, particularly given that they are uh, perhaps missing out on another important uh, objective as a cultural producer. So the research questions that I want to answer with this paper is uh, how do consumers value, uh, what value do consumers place on various characteristics of concert tickets and um, some typical characteristics I'll focus on today. How much heterogeneity uh, exists in consumer preferences for musicians to exploit uh, and how do uh, the provision of VIP packages by musicians, how these new ticketing innovations affect the welfare of live music consumers and affect the willingness to pay for concert tickets. So typically the study, oh, actually I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, so there's, there's a decent or modest literature on um, the determinants of uh, concert choice uh, and demand, mostly focusing on aggregate uh, concert demand um, with an emphasis on how technological changes in the recorded music industry have influenced the demand for concerts. Um, there's a you know, small literature looking at the determinants of individual attendance, so the preferences of certain uh, groups of consumers or uh, the factors that influence the ability to attend concerts. But um, once consumers have already decided to attend, there's little evidence about what influences um, the uh, ticket choice that they make, so what characteristics of the concerts or the tickets themselves influence um, uh, the uh, um, purchasing decision once they've already decided to go. There is some evidence that consumers are willing to pay to meet the headlining artist of a concert. Uh, so there was a study back in 2007 looking at this, but this was only um, done on a uh, uh, band of a single uh, band. So there's uh, you know, relatively limited uh, generalizability of uh, these findings. Um, and there's now a growing literature using um, discrete choice experiments and choice modeling methods to study uh, consumer preferences in um, other cultural industries, uh, but particularly in a closely related industry um, where uh, a number of researchers have uh, used um, either discrete choice experiments and choice modeling or just choice modeling methods to study preferences for theater tickets uh, with the aim of uh, improving theatre managers' um, ticketing uh, allocation pricing decisions, but these methods have also been used uh, for studying uh, consumer preferences in other uh, sort of cultural industries, such as the film and book industries, where there's technological disruption uh, and new uh, formats, new um, forms to choose from. Um, so I'm going to um, build on this last uh, last bit of literature, particularly um, motivated by the studies looking at preferences uh, for theatre tickets um, and use a discrete choice experiment and choice modelling methods to study preferences for concert tickets. So, Typically in the study of um, consumer preferences for goods, economists uh, rely on choice modelling methods which uh, are based in uh, random utility theory uh, first developed by Lancaster and developed uh, more extensively by um, notably McFadden, um, that posits that individual utility is made up of a deterministic component and a uh, random uh, error component, an unobservable component. Um, the uh, deterministic component often uh, is uh, uh, attributable to some attributes or characteristics that the analyst can observe um, and can use data based on choices to uh, estimate some taste parameters that represent the effect of these characteristics on uh, individual utility. Um, so McFadden firstly developed the uh, multinomial logit uh, model, which suggested uh, or which derived choice probabilities 
uh, based on an assumption about the error terms, the uh, unobservable random components, uh, as being this uh, ratio of the um, deterministic component of uh, attribute J over the uh, sum of the deterministic components of the other alternatives um, in the choice set. Uh, and there's some well-known um, limitations to use the multinomial logit model. Um, so uh, I'm going to also use the mixed multinomial logit and rely on this for uh, my study today, which uh, relaxes the assumption of the independence of relevant alternatives and allows um, the parameters in the choice model to uh, vary across um, uh, respondents so, uh, uh, or uh, different individuals. So uh, the um, IA assumption basically constrains um, the parameters to or the, uh, each individual to have the same uh, taste coefficients uh, and this constrains substitution patterns in a way that's typically unrealistic, particularly in this context. And so uh, the mixed multinomial logic allows us to estimate uh, parameters for each individual um, and calculate the choice probabilities in a uh, seemingly similar way. Um, and we just have this integral over the distribution of individual parameters, which are generated by a simulation um, uh, over some uh, number of draws from some multivariate distribution. Uh, and the basic premise uh, of these methods is that uh, we want to pick the parameters that best explain the observed choices. Um, and this uh, typically uh, is done by the um, maximization of the likelihood of the model or um, the you know, corresponding notion of minimizing the log likelihood with respect to the coefficients. Um, so the method, that's the methodology I'll be relying on today. Um, for um, choice modeling, we need data on individual choices. And ideally, I would be able to get data from uh, ticketing companies. Um, it's disaggregated across uh, a venue or multiple venues and linked to consumer characteristics of interest. Unfortunately, um, this data is often proprietary and uh, ticketing companies that own it are unlikely or unwilling to share it with researchers. Um, and the available data is insufficiently disaggregated. So it's aggregated to the concert level where we only have average um, prices or uh, average uh, quantities of tickets sold. Um, so not uh, disaggregated enough for this analysis. And it also is not linked to consumer characteristics. So to get around this, I uh, decided to um, generate a carefully um, designed state of preference discrete choice experiment with the aim of recreating the ticket purchase framing as closely as possible. Um, so to try and copy the, um, the way in which ticket purchases are typically done in online environments now which also has the added advantage of allowing me to experimentally vary ticket characteristics to identify uh, the parameters um, in the choice modeling stage, which is particularly useful in this context, given that uh, concert ticketing decisions by cultural producers, uh, by, by musicians, are unlikely to um, be uh, varied sufficiently um, for identification, or they're at least not going to experiment enough to allow us to uh, generalize to um, you know, prices or characteristics that we're unlikely to see uh, currently. And then I also have the ability to link this to participants' uh, socio-demographic characteristics via responses to a number of questions um, before and after the choice experiment. So I gathered some data uh, from an online sample um, of US participants recruited via the survey and panel provider Prolific. Um, I gathered 215 responses from 215 participants who each participated in 12, uh, or there was 12 choice sets in the uh, choice experiment, yields 2,580 observations for choice modeling. And as I've mentioned, I have some uh, information on their demographic um, and cultural consumption, the music uh, consumption habits. Um, so here's just some information about the respondent characteristics from the sample. I won't dwell on this too much, but uh, it skews uh, slightly male, um, skews younger, uh, skews uh, towards being slightly more single, and perhaps skews uh, more low income. Um, but I uh, won't rely on uh, these respondent characteristics too much, as we will see in a second. Um, 
So a discrete choice experiment requires uh, choices to be made about um, the uh, alternatives that consumers face, the attributes of the consumers, uh, attributes of the alternatives and uh, the levels that these attributes can take. So I wanted to make the choice experiment as realistic as uh, I could. So I based my attribute uh, an alternative selection based on um, an actual uh, uh, venue map. So I uh, created this venue map you see on the right based on um, a uh, venue in Sydney, Australia that has a layout that is fairly typical of um, indoor theatre style music venues. Um, and I use this as the basis for um, the attribute venue area. So the venue area attribute takes six levels, which correspond to six distinct venue areas. I group the venue areas um, on either side of the middle here because I suspect that consumers won't have a pref preference for one of those or the other. Um, but would perhaps prefer venue areas on the middle um, compared to being on the outside. Um, and we will set uh, the base level um, as venue area six um, so that all estimates are going to be um, uh, the effect of the utility or um, utility changes relative to this sixth area. Another um, ticket characteristic that uh, consumers often um, have a choice over uh, or sometimes uh, have a choice over is whether they want to uh, have a ticket that gives them general admission or a reserved seating option. So general admission often means that um, there's no seat um, uh, with their ticket, no seat um, you know, guaranteed and it's typically a standing ticket. Um, whereas reserve seating means that they uh, the seat that they uh, the ticket that they purchase gives them um, access to a specific seat in the venue. Um, then the attribute VIP package um, was uh, included to try and capture preferences for um, a variety of VIP services. I picked three that are sort of the dominant three in most VIP packages uh, you see. Um, that you know, big superstar artists are offering uh, often um, uh, yeah, nowadays. So the ability to meet and greet an artist, the ability to go backstage uh, before or after the show and to around um, the uh, backstage of the venue, or uh, the ability to have early access to the uh, venue um, and see the sound check. And so the um, VIP package attribute is made up of six levels of uh, combination to these three VIP services. Um, the base is no VIP package. The first level is um, only the artist meet and greet. Uh, the next uh, three levels are um, combinations of artist meet and greet, backstage tour, and early access sound check. And the final level is all three of the VIP services together. And then finally, um, the price of the um, ticket. As the last attribute, I chose 12 levels for this, ranging in $100 uh, increments from $100 to $1,200. Um, so I'm trying to capture realistic changes in ticket prices going up in $100 here, but also a realistic range given that we have the IP packages um, uh, you know, added on as part of the ticket. So that's why we've got such a high um, maximum ticket price here. Um, so here's an example of a choice set that respondents chose. Um, as you might imagine, it's quite difficult to try and prime um, respondents for this properly, um, given there's a lot of variation in the types of artists that people like to see um, and variation in uh, where they live, et cetera, that might influence this. So try to uh, control for this as much as possible um, by uh, priming every uh, uh, choice um, every choice set with uh, this passage at the top, um, where respondents were asked to imagine that a certain artist was touring um, and was playing in an upcoming concert some place nearby to where they currently live. Um, and they were, um, you know, free on the night, uh, had no other constraints on their ability to attend. Um, they wanted to attend. And the only question is which ticket to, to buy. Um, and to generate the artist name here, I uh, prior to the um, prior to the uh, choice experiment um, uh, beginning, I asked uh, all the respondents to nominate out of a set of 35 um, popular and currently touring artists which artists they 
uh, liked, which artists they had a preference for. Um, and then out of that set of artists, they were then asked which artist they had the strongest preference for. Um, and so it was that artist that they had the strongest preference for, they indicated the strongest preference for. That was then uh, coded into the um, priming questions or the priming um, paragraph before each uh, choice task. So that um, ideally we're picking up the um, artists that people have at least a strong or uh, some preference to see live. So um, I hope that this uh, you know, would be enough to capture um, uh, you know, the variation in preferences. So in this case, someone has chosen Taylor Swift, but there's 35 other artists um, that they could have chosen. And they also had the option to uh, type in their own artist if none of the 35 um, were um, uh, appealing to them. And then they were told that they went onto the ticketing site to buy a ticket for the event. Um, and these are the only four options that were available to them. Um, so they really wanted, or they were you know, uh, considering attending. These are the only four tickets that were available. Um, they wanted to attend, had to uh, choose one of those tickets, um, or if none of them were appealing, they could choose none of the above. Um, and so uh, with the 215 respondents and 12 of these choice sets, um, the data from these choices was used uh, to uh, uh, estimate the choice models. So I'll present the results from estimation now. Um, so these are the parameter estimates from the multinomial logit, the mixed multinomial logit, and the mixed multinomial logit with covariates. Um, now, these are the uh, consumer characteristics that um, I uh, attempted to um, uh, generate some information on to include in the modeling uh, and a quick caveat here that I didn't find uh, much um, uh, much evidence of deterministic uh, heterogeneity with respect to those characteristics. Um, so only when it came, comes to area type I found any evidence, uh, but I'll get onto that in a second. The estimates um, in the three columns all uh, represent the uh, parameters, the taste parameters, uh, uh, you know, the estimates of the effect of utility of changes or increases in price, for example. So negative uh, coefficients here and negative estimates suggest that increases in price decrease uh, consumer utility, which we expect to see. Uh, and the outside option here, picking up the choices from people who chose uh, or uh, situations from which people chose uh, no choice. Uh, and then I chose the price parameter all five of the venue areas and the outside option to have random parameters to try and capture um, unobserved uh, and random heterogeneity um, that's not linked to consumer characteristics. So I've got four main findings from this. Um, the first is that there is random heterogeneity in price sensitivity. So there is um, a significant degree of dispersion in the um, price uh, distribution across respondents. But importantly, this isn't associated with any respondent characteristics. I couldn't find any evidence that um, you know, consumer demographics or music consumption um, habits led to different price sensitivities. Um, and so uh, while there is uh, some um, evidence of heterogeneity, this can't be linked to um, uh, consumer characteristics. There's limited preference heterogeneity across venue areas. So across all models, um, venues areas one and two um, show significantly higher utility relative to the base level, which is venue area six. So this indicates that everyone uh, prefers the venue areas that are closest to the stage. But for venues areas three, four and five, those ones that were further away, but still uh, closer or uh, at least um, in the middle compared to venue area six, um, there wasn't any systematic evidence of high utility um, uh, indicated by respondents. So it suggests that there's a limited degree of preference heterogeneity across venue areas, and there's also limited uh, preference heterogeneity within venue areas. So only venue areas one, three, and five had uh, significantly uh, uh, or significant dispersion parameters which indicates preference heterogeneity um, or random heterogeneity within the area. Um, there was uh, some in, um, 
uh, evidence of uh, preference heterogeneity, uh, sorry, preference for um, reserved seating, so across the MNL and mixed multinomial logit um, without covariates. The uh, parameter estimates here suggest that uh, consumers prefer um, reserved seating um, tickets to general admission, but after um, interacting this parameter with some consumer characteristics and um, through model specification, it was the uh, indicator for whether a respondent had children and an ordinal measure of age, so the bracket age um, going from high, uh, lowest to highest, uh, indicated that this um, uh, average preference was primarily driven by uh, the consumers with children and the uh, older consumers. So um, uh, a unique finding here that um, people with children um, and older consumers do have a preference for reserved seating, which could be of use uh, for artists. And then finally, um, across all models, there's significantly uh, higher utility associated with VIP services. So uh, this uh, provides some initial indication that the provision of VIP services is welfare improving um, and is uh, generating um, you know, satisfaction and utility for live music consumers. So to delve into this a little bit further, um, I constructed some willingness to pay estimates based on um, individual attributes that are typically associated with VIP packages. So um, venue area one is the closest venue area to the stage, uh, reserved seating, um, the ability to meet and greet um, an artist, uh, and um, the average of the um, partial VIP packages um, as well as a full VIP uh, package in terms of the VIP services. Um, and in all cases, respondents indicated a significant willingness to pay for each of these individual att attributes. Once we um, bundle these together into ticket bundles, which we uh, usually see as part of you know, a full VIP package, um, for example, we could have a full VIP package in terms of having all three of the, the services, the meet and greet, the uh, backstage tour, and the uh, sound check and early access, plus being allowed to sit in the front section, plus having reserved seating. Uh, and across both the multinomial logit and the mixed multinomial logit, we see significant uh, willingness to pay for this full VIP package relative to not having any VIP services sitting at the back of the venue uh, or having uh, been the back venue back of the venue and having a general admission ticket. Uh, so uh, indication that um, you know, artists are able to charge significantly higher prices from providing uh, these services or setting um, tickets in this way. Um, and with a caveat, this is probably also underestimating the true market value of these types of tickets because uh, the respondents I'm picking up in the survey are unlikely to be the ones who are willing to pay the highest for um, VIP services. I, I don't suspect people taking online surveys are also the ones buying VIP tickets uh, often, but I may be wrong about that. Um, and then finally, I constructed some consumer surplus estimates based on the compensating uh, variation measure, which um, estimates estimates the amount that um, consumers uh, or respondents in the sample would need to be compensated for to remove uh, the VIP services from each um, each ticket uh, or each choice set. Uh, and um, these estimates here, the mean and median from the mixed multinomial logic, suggest that um, at current prices, uh, consumers are driving a significant amount of utility from the provision of VIP packages. So the uh, these new ticketing innovations are making uh, or uh, improving the welfare of particular consumers in the concert uh, concert industry in, in the concert market. So to sum up, um, sort of main findings from my study is that there are limited uh, or limits to the degree of traditional price discrimination uh, in terms of you know just price discriminating um, by setting uh, different ticket prices for different uh, parts of the venue or setting ticket, different ticket prices based on consumer characteristics um, implied by the limited degree of preference heterogeneity found in my choice modeling um, and coupled with 
my earlier findings from my first paper um, that artists trade off the ability to sell out um, by or when they um, pursue this sort of pricing strategy. Uh, this sort of you know, adds a bit more evidence to why perhaps we see artists um, not pursue these pricing strategies as often um, as we you know, typically expect. However, there is substantial value associated with the provision of standard VIP packages. Um, consumers are much better off um, with uh, the ability to purchase these um, VIP packages and they, pot they potentially serve as an alternative source of revenue for musicians. Um, again, with some caveats that um, this is a, you know, particularly driven by the ability to meet and greet um, the headlining artist, which musicians might not uh, be as willing to do compared to the other uh, other services. And that there's also uh, you know, reasons why we might not expect musicians to want to uh, exploit these, um, you know, this information on these preferences for VIP packages, um, you know, particularly because it might be uh, seen as violating sort of fairness perceptions by offering people, um, you know, uh, priority access or um, you know, the ability to meet superstar artists. Um, you know, musicians may not want to uh, uh, you know, engage in these sort of ticketing practices. So it would be useful, I think, as well to look into whether um, VIP package provision affects uh, fairness uh, perceptions of fans, uh, and it would also be useful to see whether these results hold for a broader range of artists um, and other consumers other than uh, the US consumers that I focused on. Uh, but uh, that's all I've got for today. Um, thank you very much for listening, and I welcome any uh, comments, questions, or suggestions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, very interesting paper. Um, I'm pretty sure that you will re raise a lot of questions and comments. Uh, let me drop a couple of uh, comments and questions. So in your uh, stated preference approach, uh, in your question uh, to your interviewees, uh, you used the, the uh, most sold, the most famous, uh, the best uh, pop uh, musician in the world, uh, namely Taylor Swift, uh, Swift <clears throat> who moreover has a peculiarity uh, to be keen in exploiting uh, a, a sort of a very high empathy she has uh, with, uh, uh, with the audiences. Uh, um, and so she's really keen in exploiting the uh, social interaction uh, during her concerts uh, with the, the audiences, uh, which uh, contributes a lot uh, to her success. Uh, so <clears throat> when uh, uh, you try to uh, generalize uh, your uh, uh, your findings, uh, how do you think this could uh, uh, possibly apply to other artists uh, still in the pop music industry? or uh, in other music uh, segments, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the so-called uh, contemporary music, uh, the contemporary classic music, uh, <clears throat> which is uh, uh, more, much more uh, uh, limited uh, in uh, audience outreach. Good question. Um, good question. Me, me and my supervisors, David and Jordi, spent a lot of time uh, working on this. Um, so I, we did, there was other artists that um, they could choose to be um, going to the concert for, so it wasn't just Taylor Swift. It, there was a, a set of 35 artists that um, I uh, chose that were broadly popular, um, that everyone should recognise their names, but were um, from you know, different genres broadly, so you know, some rap, some uh, rock, um, some alternative sort of bands, one classical musician, Andre Rue, um, just to pick up people who might be into classical music, but still popular classical music. Um, so there, there wasn't, um, there was some generalizability to popular artists, um, very highly successful popular artists um, uh, from the way we define it. But obviously it's very difficult to generalize this to you know, other artists, um, you know, apart from being highly popular artists. I, I wouldn't expect this would be able to generalize very easily to uh, classical or um, you know, orchestral music, uh, non-popular you know, uh, musical styles. Perhaps um, you know, up-and-coming musicians that 
are similar in style to popular musicians, similar to the Taylor Swift or um, you know, rock bands could think about employing these sort of uh, methods as well. But I wouldn't expect the um, willingness to pay uh, to meet and greet um, artists that are much less popular than Taylor Swift would be anywhere near as high um, uh, as um, what we estimated in the study. But in any event, we are picking up some you know, preference for these packages, um, you know, once controlling for the artist. Um, so it does indicate that there is some, you know, willingness to um, have more connection with the artist um, and with the event overall, which I guess, yeah, it sort of talks to the social, um, you know, perception of the social um, nature of concerts that um, could be utilised uh, a little bit more by concert organisers and musicians of uh, other styles and sizes as well. All right, thank you for your reply. Uh, are there uh, any comments or questions? Please feel free to write them in the chat or if you prefer, you can raise your hand and you can uh, um, uh, contribute live to this, uh, to this seminar. Otherwise, I have uh, another uh, comment and question. Uh, uh, it is quite interesting uh, to notice uh, the, um, uh, uh, the significant, uh, significance and magnitude of the outside option. Um, so uh, this can translate into indifference, uh, <coughs> sorry, to attend the concert or uh, not willingness in a negative sense uh, to attend the concert. So namely non-demand uh, for the arts, uh, in this case for music. And I think uh, there you have uh, an interesting amount of information you could uh, further exploit in order to study the non-demand uh, for uh, uh, these kind of packages. Uh, uh, in live music. Uh, so can you please uh, elaborate on that? I'm also curious to know what was uh, the, the number of respondents uh, um, <clears throat> who are part of the outside option. Um, so the, the outside option was modeling um, the choices or the, the, the op when respondents chose none of the above in any given choice set. So when any of the four uh, available tickets wasn't appealing to uh, them in any choice set. So the way we interpreted this was that it was the um, reduction in utility um, associated with not attending the concert, knowing that the concert was on, but having no ticket options that they were willing to purchase that were too expensive or wasn't a combination of characteristics that um, was appealing to them. But uh, in not being able to attend the concert, they were left worse off um that that's that's how we interpreted uh interpreted it here um there was there was a fairly low number of people choosing um none of the above i can't remember uh exactly the the number um who chose that in the end but most in most choices most choice sets respondents were choosing at least one of the options which you know, I, it, likely to see in choice experiments like this where there's no real the, the hypothetical nature of it means there's no real consequence of them choosing um a you know option even if it's too expensive um but yeah that's that's the way we interpreted that outside option that it was more um the reduction in utility that people experience if um, they can't attend because the ticket prices are too high or you know other um, characteristics aren't amenable to them Uh, I think there is a question from Jonathan Fry, please. Hi, Dylan. Thanks for the presentation. It was really interesting. Um, so the kind of comment I have to start with in the follow-up question is regarding the marketing of the packages from the organisers. So sometimes with the VIP packages, for example, they might um, promote the packages as having the best seat in the house and that sort of thing in terms of the quality of the seated ticket. And I read an article recently that one of the purchases of the Taylor Swift concert in Edinburgh were frustrated that they bought a VIP package and it had a side view mm -hmm. of the stage. 
Um, so you mentioned you were trying to replicate the purchase experience and kind of ticketing purchase. So my question is really, did you gain in any insights in terms of consumer preferences, perceptions of what the best seats are um, and the marketing side? Because sometimes, you know, if you're purchasing a ticket, you only have a minute to add the tickets to the you know checkout process yeah. and that sort of thing. So, yeah, that's my question, really. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, good to see you. Here. Um, thanks for coming and watching. Um, yeah, so the, the I was sort of limited in my ability to um, get much insight in terms of the angle from the stage. We've got more estimates uh, uh, associated with distance. So some of those estimates show that you know the first and second venue area, the, the two that was closest to the stage, people uh, indicated or there was systematic um, you know evidence of uh, preference for those areas, but not for areas further away from the stage relative to the, the, the area that I decided or I uh, suspected would be the worst, the, the back corner area. Um, unfortunately, due to mainly budget limitations, I was constrained with my ability to make the venue map sort of larger and to wrap around the stage a lot more. Um, so the more venue areas, basically the more participants I would have needed to um, estimate the choice model uh, correctly uh, or to you know, get estimates um, with significant parameters and um, just in terms of having to pay people, I didn't have enough of my budget uh, as part of my PhD to do that. I, I might have actually been able to do it um, with the way the choice experiment ended up working out, but in the design of these things, um, you sort of don't really know. You get, you get a bit of an indication um, doing some testing at the start. We don't really know until afterwards. So um, perhaps later on, um, you know, it'd be, it'd be useful, particularly with um, some actual ticketing data, to sort of pair up with another experiment like this to try and increase the power, the statistical power of the study, um, and get more insight to um, different venue areas. Yeah, there's not much generalizable, um, not much that I can generalize from this one in particular, but at least there's some sort of evidence that people, you know sort of sounds common sense but people want to be close to the stage um further away they don't really they don't really care so much if they're further away each venue is basically the same to them i think janice noble is uh typing her comment or question in the chat or jen would you like to uh, directly uh, formulate it live uh, um, great, thank you. Thanks very much. And uh, Dylan, I just wanted to say good paper. Congratulations on that. Um, I read it um, as part of the Young Researchers um, Workshop um, that I uh, for, for the conference. I'm just going to switch off my camera because I'm, I'm at a conference in Lagos at the moment and the comms are not so good. So that's it. Um, so my, my question really relates to um, when you were talking about possible uh, feelings of unfairness, um, you know, that artists might not want to um, offer the, these VIP packages because although it could increase their revenue, um, it might also lead fans to think, you know, that there's some kind of break between um, the two. But of course, um, one can actually um, cross subsidize um, across groups of people with hiring comes who prepared to pay for VIP packages um, in order to allow average uh, prices of ordinary tickets um, to be lower. So, um, uh, you know, that that could also be a utility maximizing strategy, couldn't it? What, what do you think of that? Yeah, definitely. I, hadn't, I actually hadn't thought about that. That's a good, that's a good point. Um, I guess, you know, it, if that was well, um, well advocated, well uh, marketed, um, as part of the event that you know there was VIP packages going on uh, sale, but um, ticket the other ticket options were also going to be lower. Um, you know, I think that would definitely um, help to alleviate any negative uh, fairness or reputational concerns associated with the offering of the, uh, the VIP packages. Um, I, I guess I can't think of many artists that have tried doing that either. So it would be um, a useful. Uh, you know, useful avenue to explore. Uh, it feels like ticket prices for concerts of any of any type are just going up sort of continuously at the moment, um, and people are you know, often quite annoyed about that. Uh, but there are obviously good reasons for artists to 
um, you know, of all, all types to try and uh, maximise their returns from content ticketing. So um, I think, yeah, it, it would be interesting to see uh, some artists uh, try such an approach um, and whether fans would uh, ultimately um, you know, back them on them. Great. Thank you. And and I guess just a, a sort of follow up to that should be, I was wondering about the sort of um, supply side costs of, of the VIP packages, mm. um, which which I know wasn't really the focus of, you know, of your research. Um, but I was just thinking about, well, maybe it's 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 like a business class in airlines, you know, there, there's space implications. Um, mm. If it was a meet and greet with artists, there'd definitely be sort of time implications, maybe their security implications. So uh, maybe just to sort of mention that somewhere that this is not a, you know, the supply side would also have to adjust a little bit in order to um, to accommodate yeah, some yeah. of the things that are part of, of VIP packages. Yeah, yeah thank Jen. you. But but thanks again. Great. No, thank you, Jen. Okay, so if there are not other questions or comments from the audience, uh, so Dylan, you are a young uh, researcher. So what is next? Uh, because uh, you are uh, rather at the beginning of your career. So can you please uh, tell us a little bit of your unveil uh, to us a little bit uh, uh, about your next plans? So you are uh, doing your PhD at Macquarie University in uh, Sydney, Australia. So what, uh, what are your uh, next plans? Um, at the moment, it's just focusing on getting the PhD done. To be honest, I, I um, submit in March next year, so I'm I'm trying not to think too much about um, what comes after that uh, because it just you know it, it gets distracting, and I'd, I'd like to um, do the best job I can um, for the PhD at present. Um, I've been I've been discussing uh, with Joanna and uh, Doug um, some employment opportunities that they uh, were. Um, uh, advertising through um, the association recently, um, so perhaps I'll um, be working with them for uh, some period next year. Um, and I'm going to start, yeah, probably come next year, start looking for postdocs, um, uh, some you know, lecturing positions uh, uh, just around the world, um, see what's what's available, um, try and get the papers published and get a research profile. Um, but yeah, I'm just trying to take it one step at a time and not to get too ahead of myself uh, at the moment, to be honest. Well, we are pretty sure you're quite well uh, uh, positioned for that. Uh, um, another uh, another uh, consideration, uh, you know that uh, um, researchers, we, we are uh, increasingly asked uh, to have an impact uh, uh, on society. So in your case, it would be the, the music industry. Uh, uh, have you, uh, do you have any uh, collaboration with the music industry? Uh, to what extent your research, uh, uh, e even in a perspective, uh, um, is possibly um, capable of uh, uh, producing an impact on the music industry? Um, with the, the, the couple of papers that I've um, finished, not quite finished, but are close to finishing for my PhD, um, perhaps limited um, influence. My, my last paper, I hope, will have some some more impact, but still probably fairly academically um, uh, sort of constrained. I have been discussing or have been chatting to um, uh, some contacts uh, at the Australian um, or the old Australian Council of the Arts, what we now call this Creative Australia, which has uh, they're starting up a program focused on Australian musicians and um, they're, they're uh, reaching out, wanting researchers to help them with um, cultural policy uh, in terms of the Australian music industry. Um, and I do have um, some contacts in record labels that have uh, indicated that they're interested in looking at my research afterwards. So um, there, there's definitely some, some potential. Um, uh, next year, hopefully we'll have a few uh, a few more options, particularly with the cultural policy angle. Um, but uh, with a few papers that I've got in in, in mind in the works, um, perhaps we'll also have some influence on uh, record labels as well. That's terrific. Uh, we are so happy to hear that. And uh, also the, the music industry stakeholders and players, uh, I'm pretty sure. 
All right, so if there are not other questions or comments, uh, even in writing from, uh, from the audience, uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dylan Thompson uh, very much uh, for his presentation uh, and to congratulate uh, him uh, again uh, for uh, um, uh, achieving the prize, uh, the Victor Fernandez Blanco Prize by the Association for Cultural Economics. Uh, uh, international and uh, please uh, if you haven't done so uh, mark your agenda for your the next CEOs uh, um, we will uh, switch from the music industry to the art market uh, and we will have the presentation by Jai Ping Mei uh, one of the recipients of the Pomeran Prize uh, uh, um, by the Journal of uh, Cultural Economics, uh, the Journal of the Association for Cultural Economics International. Thank you so much for uh, being here, for listening and for uh, uh, contributing actively uh, to this seminar and uh, see you next month. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dylan. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you, everyone.